Hi, I'm Michael Ballantyne. This talk is about an implementation strategy for macroextensible domain-specific languages. We work on Racket, which is a macroextensible programming language. But the ideas I'll be talking about apply in other macroextensible languages as well. Racket's macros allow programmers to extend the syntax of the language and to build internal domain-specific languages. Our goal is to allow programmers to write each part of their program in a DSL that's well suited to the problem being solved. Then programmers can compose these pieces into a complete program. You might not know much about Racket, and this language-oriented style of programming may not seem familiar. But there is a language in which many of us regularly use these ideas, Tech. Tech is a macro-extensible language, and most of the time we write our documents using more specialized languages created with macros atop tech, such as LaTeX. And we don't only use one such DSL. If we need to include a diagram, we might create it using Tixi, which is a declarative drawing language built on top of tech. Tixi is a significant language in its own right, and it's used to create diagrams for a wide variety of domains. But it's hard to create complex diagrams with just points, lines, and primitive shapes. So Tixi itself is macro-extensible. Programmers can create higher-level drawing languages for particular kinds of diagrams. For example, Circuit Tixi is a language for creating circuit diagrams. There are dozens of this kind of extension to Tixi for different domains. Racket's ecosystem is similar to Tech. Programmers use a variety of DSLs, and many of them are macro-extensible. So here are a few examples. Racket's algebraic pattern matcher is implemented as a language extension in the standard library, rather than as a built-in feature. We can think of its language of patterns as a DSL, and it's macro-extensible with pattern macros. Uh, Rash is an interactive shell and scripting language that mixes Racket code with traditional shell pipelines. Programmers can add new pipeline syntax, uh, like a redirection operator, with pipeline macros. And typed racket is a type dial dialect of racket. Macros can ex extend its syntax at both the term and type levels. So racket programmers want, and in fact build, DSLs that are themselves extensible. But racket doesn't provide tools designed for creating these extensible DSLs. That means that building them is difficult and hard to get right. This talk presents two ideas about how to implement extensible DSLs properly. The first is an architectural idea that's been around in the Racket community for some time. The second is a new API to Racket syntax system that supports that architecture. This API makes it easier to create extensible DSLs that fit together smoothly with Racket and with each other. To start, let's talk about what qualities we want from an extensible DSL. The point of using a DSL is to take advantage of its specialized behaviors. So we want to be able to implement any kind of grammar, static semantics, and even optimizing compilation. At the same time, we'd like the DSL to integrate well with the host language, so that it's easy to put together parts that are written in different DSLs. As far as macro extensibility, macros for the DSL should work in the same way as macros for the host language. And finally, we'd like our IDE to understand at least the binding structure of the DSL, so features like jump to definition work automatically. The first big idea to achieve these goals is to use the same architecture to make DSLs extensible that we use to make Racket extensible. Racket uses a macro expander that transforms programs using the extensible surface syntax into a fixed core language. Then a traditional multi-pass compiler can analyze the core language syntax, perform optimizations, and generate code in the target language. DSLs can use this same architecture. A DSL expander will transform DSL code with macros into a DSL core language. Because the core language is fixed, a DSL compiler can analyze the DSL syntax and apply domain-specific optimizations. The DSL compiler then generates racket code. We want to create internal DSLs integrated with racket. So the racket and DSL expansion and compilation pipelines need to connect. The connection between languages is established by what we call interface macros. When the expander encounters such a macro, it passes off the DSL syntax to the DSL expander and compiler. 
the code generated by the DSL compiler is returned to the Racket Expander to be integrated as part of the overall program. So to make this idea more concrete, let's look at an example. A DSL for parsing expression grammars, or pegs. Here's an example of a parser specification written in our implementation of pegs. It defines a parser for simple arithmetic expressions consisting of sequences of additions and subtractions. Each defined peg defines a grammar non-terminal. The right-hand side is a peg expression, which may include a reference to other non-terminals, sequences, repetitions, alternatives, and literal character strings. The peg DSL comes with a static semantics. Left recursive non-terminals are forbidden. This is because if we parse using a left recursive peg, we'd get an infinite loop. So we write the arithexpr non-terminal using er repetition rather than recursion. And our DSL implementation checks for left recursion at compile time and raises a syntax error highlighting the loop if it finds any. To make much use of a parser, we'll need to integrate it with Racket so that we can do something with the result. So we weave together the DSL and Racket. We make peg definitions part of Racket modules, and we add semantic actions that we write as Racket expressions. Altogether, the module here uh, contains three parts, a structure type for representing the abstract syntax tree, a, a helper function to turn repetitions into left-associated trees, and the non-terminal definitions, uh, which now have parse variable bindings indicated by the colon operator. Uh, and now contain a semantic action that calls left associate. The defined peg macro forms the interface between Racket and the peg DSL, dispatching to the peg expander and compiler. So now that we have the peg expander, we can abstract over peg expressions using macros. Consider extending the arithexpr parser with multiplication and division operators. We want these to have a higher precedence than addition and subtraction. We'll need to copy the structure of the arithexpr non-terminal for each of the precedence levels. Macros let us do this concisely by pulling out the common structure and instantiating it once for each precedence level. Uh, we see that in this extended definition of arithexpr. To see how expansion and compilation proceed, let's walk through a super simple example. So here's a parser for comparison operators. Uh, we just have an alternative among several character sequences. Racket will dispatch to the DSL pipeline via define peg, and the first step there is to expand macros. The alt syntax isn't part of the core language. Rather, it's a macro that expands to the binary alternatives that we see in the expansion on the right. Given the DSL program expressed entirely in the core language, as on the right, the DSL compiler can look for patterns and apply optimizations. Here, it recognizes the special case of alternatives between character sequences only, which it compiles to an efficient binary search. So what did we get out of using this DSL expander approach for the PEG DSL? Well, first, racket and PEG syntax are synta syntactically distinguished, and the grammar of each is enforced. So if we make a syntax mistake, we'll get an informative error from the respective expander. Second, the DSL compiler can enforce any kind of static semantics. In this case, the prohibition of left recursion. And finally, the DSL compiler can analyze the syntax to perform op optimizations. So for example, the optimiz optimization we just saw for alternatives with only character sequences. On to our second big idea. Rather than implement DSL expanders totally from scratch, we can reuse features from Racket's expander. To do this, the Racket expander needs to be built in two layers. One layer implements concepts that we will share between languages, and the other layer implements the parts that are specific to Racket syntax. We've created a new API that allows DSL expanders to reuse the shared layer. So next, let's look at how DSL expanders use the concepts in that shared API. Scopes, macro hygiene, the expander environment, and the module system. We've seen that programs can intermix languages, and that variables bound by one language can be referenced in another language. 
In this example, the racket expander creates a scope for the module body, which contains PEG non-terminal bindings. And the PEG expander creates a scope for the semantic action, which includes parse variable bindings in the PEG language and references to those parse variables in the racket action expression. To make these interactions work, all the expanders need to share a common understanding of scope. Macros add another dimension to scope. Consider this expansion of the binops macro. Here, the macro is defined in one module, but used in another. Looking at the expansion, we see that it includes references to names from both of the contexts. So how are those references resolved? The basic idea is to divide the identifiers in the expansion into two projections, those originating from the use of the macro and those originating from the definition. These two groups of identifiers are put into two different scopes. Matthew Flatt's set of scopes algorithm uses these scopes and those discussed on the previous slide to ensure that macros obey our intuitive expectations of a lexical scope. So to handle scope, DSL expanders need to use our API for several operations. They create scopes, apply scopes to syntax, uh, expand macros while applying use site and definition site scopes, and finally resolve names using the set of scopes algorithm. Another element that DSL expanders reuse via our API is the expander environment. Expansion needs to keep track of the syntactic role of each name. Does it refer to a variable or to a macro? And if it's a macro, how should it expand? When the racket expander encounters a binding, it records this kind of information in its expander environment. Here, the left of the slide shows the content of the expander environment after the expansion of the program on the right. Consider the left associate function definition. Define is actually a racket macro on top of a more primitive definition form. So the expander looks up define in the expander environment to find the transformer procedure that implements the macro. Once the definition is expanded to the primitive syntax, racket's expander records that left associate is bound as a racket variable. DSL expanders also need to keep track of syntactic roles and macro implementations, just like racket's expander. With our API, they can reuse racket's expander environment to enable integration between the languages. So for a PEG macro, such as binops, uh, it gets recorded in the expander environment much like a racket macro. However, it's tagged as a macro for the PEG language. That way, if it's mistakenly used in a racket context, the racket expander knows to report an error. The PEG expander also records the role of non-terminal definitions. And when it encounters a reference in a PEG expression, it checks that the name is bound as a non-terminal. In the expanded definition of Arithexper, uh, we have parse variable bindings for E1, ops, and E's. The PEG expander will record these as racket variable bindings rather than PEG bindings so that the racket action expression can refer to them. There's one more complication regarding the expander environment. PEG parser specifications can be spread across multiple racket modules. Here, the term and op non-terminals are defined in one module and used by the Arithexper non-terminal in another module. When the first module expands, the DSL expander records the roles of the term and op names in the expander environment. But when the second module is separately compiled, the expander starts off with a fresh environment. In order to understand the non-terminal references, it needs the information from the first expansion. Racket's expander and module system know how to save and carry along this information between expansions. So by reusing Racket's modules and expander environment, DSLs get this behavior too. So what all did we get out of this reuse of features from the host expander? Well, DSLs share an understanding of scope and binding with Racket and with other DSLs. So we can implement cross-language bindings like peg parse variables. DSL programs can also be split across modules, and modules can contain code belonging to multiple languages. Finally, the same APIs that record bindings and perform lookups in the expander environment uh, 
also record information for the IDE. So features like jump to definition automatically work for DSLs. We developed the PEG DSL along with our new API. So to evaluate the value of the architecture and API for DSLs more broadly, we selected four other already existing DSLs from the Racket ecosystem. We modified each of the DSLs to use the DSL expander architecture and our new API. These include typed Racket and the RAS shell language we mentioned earlier, but we also created modified versions of the mini Canon logic programming language and of Racket's DSL for parsing command line arguments. Our modifications improved each DSL in one of three ways. Either it made the language newly macro extensible, or it enabled new language features uh, that were possible only because of the DSL core language and custom compiler, or it modified an existing DSL expander to reuse elements of Racket's expander. There's more about each of these languages in the paper. To sum up the message of our work, we found that we can get lots of flexibility to implement domain-specific language features by using custom DSL expanders and compilers. But at the same time, we can integrate tightly with the host language and other DSLs by sharing the host expander's syntax system via an API. We expect to continue our work by integrating language workbench ideas into extensible languages. Our goal is to enable DSL creators to describe internal DSLs via declarative meta-DSLs, like those in language workbenches.